let's explore some key concepts in diagenesis that will underpin your understanding of key processes. Welcome to Snake Gorge, Oman. You can certainly find snakes underneath the rocks, but the name also comes from the fact that this is a meandering river that deeply cuts into the carbonates of the Oman Mountains. But the reason I brought you here is because behind me, you can see red streaks of late dolomite, a diagenetic product. And obviously the gorge was formed by water. And one of the themes that we're going to discuss in this class is precisely water-rock ratio and the importance of water and saturation in driving diagenetic reaction in carbonates. If we look at this diagram here from Hommel and Al, published in 2020, the key message I want to bring is that the pore space in carbonate rock contains water and ions. And what really matters for us in diagenesis is the process of precipitation dissolution. So you dissolve the carbonates and you precipitate the carbonates. Dissolution will lead to porosity enhancement. Precipitation will lead, of course, to decrease in porosity and by extension, probably to less good permeability. So this is absolutely key. And what, what is also key from this uh, reactive transport work here is to realize that water is essential for every diagenetic reaction in carbonate rock because it's the, the principle is really that you need to dissolve and precipitate your reaction. So water is really key. For this, we have the concept of water-rock ratio. So what is water-rock ratio? Well, very simply, it's the total amount of water that a given rock is seeing throughout its, its diagenetic life cycle. So if we look at water rock ratio, the first thing we can say is that diagenesis is proportional to the water rock ratio. And that's a very fundamental thing to understand is that the amount of water that circulates through the rock is going to be a factor that determines how much diagenesis is taking place. We will also see that, of course, the chemistry of that particular fluid and its temperature plays a role, but one key fundamental parameter is the water-rock ratio. So if diagenesis is, is proportional to water-rock ratio, what is the water-rock ratio proportional to? Well, the first thing is porosity or the volume of water compared to the volume of rock. So the water-rock ratio is obviously proportional to the weight percent of water. So if you have a lot of porosity and a lot of permeability, you tend to have a higher water rock ratio. So you facilitate more diagenetic transformation. But that's not the only thing. The second thing that plays a role is the flow of water. So the water rock ratio is proportional to the flow of water that goes through a, a, a volume of rock. And finally, time plays a big role. So the water rock ratio is also proportional to time. So if we put this into a diagram, it would give us something like this. So this is, this is a plot that basically plots a surface that represents a water rock ratio of 0 0.5. So every point on this surface has the same water rock ratio, which means that it has the same potential for diagenetic transformation. And the key here is to realize that whether you have high porosity, high flow, or a long amount of time will give you the same results. You will have a high fluid rock ratio. But if you have less porosity, less flow, or a shorter time of exposure, your water rock ratio will be lower. So these things are interlinked. You can move one and compensate by the other. For instance, you can have less porosity permeability, but a higher flow, or maybe a lower flow, lower permeability, but a very long time of exposure, and thus the same water rock ratio. So, so keep this in mind when you look at diagenetic processes. So this implies that we need a mechanism to move fluids through the rock. 
And that can be either a slow movement or a fast movement, but a key to diagenetic transformation is moving water through the rock. So in other words, what we need is a pump for diagenetic fluid, so a diagenetic pump. And here, of course, we're looking at an oil pump, and this is, not, this is not how you generate diagenesis. What we have is natural pumps, and when we look at different environments, we'll talk about what the different pumps could be in different systems. Now, the other fundamental concept, other than the fluid rock ratio, if you want to understand diagenesis, is to understand the nature of the fluid. And for this, we need to understand what saturation in a given mineral is and how you can actually dissolve or precipitate a given uh, mineral. So this figure shows you the saturation of calcite in the ocean. And um, notice that the number goes from 0 to 1, that's the red, all the way to 5 to 6. 0 to 1 means you're undersaturated with respect to calcite, so that means that you're completely dissolving calcite. And any number above uh, 1 means that you're saturated with respect to uh, calcite. But keep in mind for calcite and aragonite that if the saturation is under 3, it's very difficult to precipitate a carbonate for, let's say, corals or organisms that produce a, a skeleton. So 3 really seems to be a, a crucial threshold here. And on this diagram, you can see that we have temperature on the horizontal axis and water depth, which equates to pressure on the vertical axis. And don't worry too much about the red dot here. What matters is to notice that the higher the temperature, the more saturated the fluid becomes with respect to calcite. Remember, we saw that in one of our very first classes when we talked about the tropical ocean being super saturated. So this is a, this is a crucial point here that I want to repeat. And the deeper the water masses, so the higher the pressure, the less saturated you become with respect to calcite. And you can see we stop here at six kilometers and you know that at roughly five, six kilometers when we're in this uh, zone marked as zone two, we have more dissolution than we have precipitation. So we, we've reached the CCD here and we're losing all the calcite in the ocean. We can plot the same diagram for aragonite and no surprise here, you see that aragonite has a much lower saturation uh, in general than calcite. So basically we have at the surface ocean here uh, in, in pretty much any temperatures between 0 and 30, a saturation of 3 to 4, a saturation of 3 to 4. But in the deep ocean, we are down to 1 to 2, so very low saturation. We're barely saturated with respect to aragonite. But the key is to keep in mind that calcite will be more oversaturated in the modern ocean than aragonite.